we'll start with this. Well, it appears that Yo Costavaye, the reigning IBF minimum weight champion, has a fight coming up against an opponent that has yet to be announced. Yo Costia was last in action in January of this year against her IBF mandatory, Sana Hazuki. Whoever it is, she's going to be fighting on June, June 11th, Friday. To stateside. Whoever it is. It, it must be a voluntary title defense. And, and, and the location of the match really got my attention, sparked my curiosity, because this ain't set to go down in, in, in Yo Costa's native Costa Rica. Oh. This is going down at the Sports Arena in Pico Rivera, California, USA. California. What's Yo Costa Valle doing fighting in California? You know, Sanicia Estrada's from California. No, I don't think that Yo Costa Valle's very next match is going to be a unification match, a unification fight, though one can interpret this as a prelude oh. to a unification fight. What would draw the reigning IBF champion, Yo Costa Valle, out of her native Costa Rica to fight in California? Who's in California? I'll tell you who's in California. Sinicia Striata is in California. Is this the prelude? Is this build-up for a Sinicia Estrada unification match? I mean, I don't really know where we are with that Tina Ruprecht unification match. That was supposed to go down, but the conditions were not permissible for the two champions to meet up with each other, so they decided to take care of business separately. Yo Valle has already defended her IBF title. Tina Ruprecht of Germany, the reigning WBC minimum weight champion, she's going to take care of her own business very soon. So I don't know where we are with that fight. Maybe the Valle people want to unify with somebody else. There are four reigning world champions in a minimum weight division. Atsuko Tata holds WBO title of Japan. Yo Valle of Costa Rica holds the IBF title. Tina Ruprecht of Germany, who holds the WBC title and newly crowned WBA minimum weight champion, Sinicia Estriata. Oh. Just so happens to be from California. Bastos. Gonna be keeping an eye on this situation and whatever it is that this movement indicates though one way to interpret Yo Costa Valle traveling California for her very next fight is I don't know maybe that's a prelude to an Estrada unification match we'll see in other news Deborah Dionysius is set to be having a tune-up fight in preparation of the upcoming Dina Thorsland WBO bantamweight title fight that's right Debra is going to be in action towards the end of this month against journey woman Gloria Young Sakeo it's pretty obvious why up until this point, Deborah hasn't had a fight in the last 12 months. The last time she was in action was in March of last year. She's got ring rust to shake off. This is a prelude to the Dina Thorslin fight. This is preparation for it. For those of you out there who are not familiar with Deborah Dionysius, she was the IBF's super flyweight champion, held the title for a while, defended it a couple of times. Oh. Up until 2018, when she ran into her countrywoman, Jorgelina Guanini, who beat her out for it. That is the same Jorgelina Guanini who very recently stood in for Ebony Bridges ahead of what was supposed to be the Rachel Ball fight. We know that Ebony suffered some kind of an injury. She had to pull out of the fight. They had to get a short notice opponent and Jorgelina Guanini stepped in. Gave Rachel Ball all she could handle at 118 pounds, but Rachel did manage to secure the W. That's the same Jorgelina Guanini that beat Deborah Dionysius for what was the IBF title. Super flyweight title. And now, Deborah Dionysius is vying to become a bantamweight champion. She's many ways moving up for this fight, whereas Dina Thorsland, she's moving down. She's moving down from 122 to 118. And like I told you guys, 118 in the next couple of months, you know, this year, it's going to become one of the more watched divisions in women's boxing because that's where Ebony Bridges and Shannon Courtney just fought. That's oh. where Shannon holds the WBA title. You can expect this division to get a lot more attention moving forward. So, Deborah Dionysius is set to be having a tuna fight with Gloria at the end of this month, and then she's set to lock horns thereafter in June against Dina Thorsland, who pretty soon is going to vacate her WBO 122-pound title to contest for the 118-pound version of the title. Now, the fight with Gloria, the tuna fight. That's set to go down in Deborah's native Argentina, whereas the fight with Dina, Dina Thorsland, the WBO bantamweight title fight, that's set to go down in Dina's neck of the woods. That's set to go down in Denmark. What's working for Deborah 
in that situation is that she's got a lot more pro experience than Dina Thorsland does. Dina Thorsland, who is unbeaten as a professional, though not as experienced as Deborah. Deborah's got twice as many fights, more than twice as many. 30 professional victories, two losses, six knockouts, never been stopped. You know those Argentinian fighters, you know they got a reputation for being tough. You know they got a reputation for also being heavy handed. Essentially what I'm getting at is, it's not a foregone conclusion that Dina Thorsland wins this fight. It really isn't. In spite of having home field advantage, she's got a live one in front of her. I think at minimum, that's the conclusion that we can come to. Though when it comes to Deborah, the fact that the fight is taking place on foreign soil, you know what they say. Don't coast and don't leave it in the hands of the judges. Or try your best not to. This is a very good, even fight. Very intriguing. You know. Dean is the younger fighter, no career blemishes, though at the same time, deborah has got a lot more pro experience than Dina does, though Dina has home field advantage. Oh. This fight will crown the WBO champion at 118 pounds. Whoever emerges the victor will be a major player at this weight. The winner of this fight is likely someone that Shannon Courtney is going to target for a unification match because Shannon let it be known in so many words that she's not just going to stop at one world title. She wants to be a unified champion. In order to do that, at least at this weight, she's going to have to see the winner of this fight. And I'm telling you, it's not a foregone conclusion. Both girls, they got something working for them. And once Deborah Dionysius gets this tune-up fight out of the way, both girls will have seen action in the last 12 months. So there won't be any pesky ring rust to shake off in their fight, the title fight. Looking forward to this, and we'll talk more about the fight as the fight date approaches. We then come to this weekend's action involving young Edgar Berlanga and Desmond Nicholson, a fight that took place last night in the super middleweight division. A learning fight for Edgar, and I think a, a very beneficial one. You know, Edgar, up until this point, he's basically stopping everybody in the first round. He was. And, and that's a blessing and a curse. Because, yeah, you're stopping, guys, and, and that's what you want to do. You want to win. You want to win in spectacular fashion, emphatic fashion, that leaves an impression on the boxing fans. Though, at the same time, if every time you get under those hot lights, you finish the guy quick, that doesn't afford you the opportunity to take away anything, to learn something, learn something new. So if the day comes that, you know, you're hitting a guy and he's taking your best shots, he can deal with them. You're not a deer in the headlights. Y you need those experiences. I saw people ready levying criticism towards Edgar, saying he was exposed. Yeah, break. There's a lot of people that are already calling him a hype job, and I really don't know why, because ahead of this fight, he was only 16-0, and 0, fighting the kind of guys you expect a guy who's 16-0 and 0 to fight. I mean, I just didn't see much cause for criticism, and, and having seen the fight with Desmond Nicholson, I, I still don't see cause for criticism. I see some wrinkles that might need to be ironed out, some areas that need attention that, you know, Edgar hurt Desmond Nicholson more than once in this fight, dropped him more than once in this fight. Edgar, you know, he could have closed the show. There were opportunities there to finish this guy, but I think that Edgar, having not gone into the second round, the third round, fourth round, fifth round, etc., etc., I think that because he didn't have those experiences yet from having stopped everyone he fought in the first round, I think that because he didn't have those experiences yet, you know, it was a little harder to close the show this time. He was in unfamiliar territory, and that's okay. That's what learning fights are for. Credit to Desmond Nicholson and his survival instincts throughout the course of this match. It really is a wonder that he was able to go the distance, having been dropped as many times as he was dropped, having absorbed what he absorbed. This was a step-up fight for Edgar Berlanga, but it wasn't a fight that got away from him. I mean, it's not like this was a hard fight to score or anything like that. I think that moving forward, Edgar could maybe stand to use the jab a little more, double up on it. I think he could stand to make more of an investment in the body because he's a very strong puncher. And, and you're not always going to get off that big right hand. You don't want to turn into a headhunter committing to the straight right or the looping right. So I am confident that Edgar will round out as a fighter, mostly because of who trains him, Andre Rosier. That's the same Andre Rosier that trains Sergei Didivyanchenko. That's the same Andre Rosier that trained Daniel Jacobs for some of his biggest fights. The Quillen fight, the Didivyanchenko fight, the Golovkin fight, the Canelo fight. I'm confident in Andre Rosier's ability to turn Edgar into more than just a puncher. 
And I'm not going to hold it against Edgar that maybe he needs a little bit more experience because, well, he's been stopping everybody in the first round. What do you want him to do? Huh? You want him to go in there carrying guys? Huh? I'll tell you. I don't understand certain boxing fans. I really don't. Sometimes I think that uh, certain folks are just in a hurry to say something negative for whatever reason because Edgar, Edgar's not a, a, a gold medalist or an Olympian or something like that. I mean, he's not one of those, one of those guys that get fast-tracked through the ranks, start taking on world-level contenders early. He's, he's not one of those fighters. You're talking about a young guy, early 20s, who ahead of this fight only had 16 professional fights, yet for some reason, people are expecting that he should have already fought killers. Oh. I don't know why that is. Near as I can tell, uh, uh, Edgar's solid fighter, solid so far, good showing for him. He actually absorbed some hard shots from Desmond Nicholson in this fight. I, I think that's a very important litmus test for Edgar's punch resistance. He had a clean right hand, really got my attention, though it didn't seem to get his as he kept plowing forward, oh. laying into Desmond Nicholson. I think uh, moving forward, Edgar could stand to be a little busier. On the heels of this performance, I'm not sure that they put him in there with Jesse Hart in his very next fight. Because I reiterate, Edgar hurt Desmond several times throughout the course of this match. Dropped him several times throughout the course of this match. But he didn't finish him. And I'd wager that Jesse Hart is a little bit more elusive than Desmond Nicholson. He's a harder target, harder guy to hit. I don't know that the Hart fight will be the very next fight for Edgar. Though if it were... I wouldn't complain, as that is an intriguing situation given where Edgar is right now. I have to say that having seen the fight, I, I do view the heart fight as a risky fight. It is risky. Uh, uh, another option that perhaps can be employed for young Edgar is Gabriel Rosario, Philly Rican, Puerto Rican, like Edgar, except Edgar's from New York. Better still, that's a fight that you can state New York City the week of the Puerto Rican type of rain. Just an idea. Just a little suggestion. Putting that out there. I have to say, uh, solid showing for Edgar. I wasn't blown away. I'm not overly impressed with it. But I don't see any cause for criticism either. When you've been stopping everybody you fight in the first round, there are going to be wrinkles. And that's okay. It's a learning experience in what was a learning fight. We then come to the main event of that same card. The Navarrete versus Diaz WBL featherweight title fight. A very aesthetically pleasing fight. Both men gave a very good account of themselves. Credit to Diaz, who's really made from some tough stuff. For him to have endured what he endured at the hands of the very unorthodox, Bacero. albeit very powerful, Emmanuel Navarrete. Diaz is really something else, man. There were plenty of outs for him to just call it a day and, and go home, but he didn't want to go out like that. He he wanted to go out on his shield, and it's a credit to him that he didn't because he took a lot of hard shots. I, I lost count of how many times the guy got dropped. Oh. The point deficit alone would have discouraged a lot of fighters from trying as hard as Diaz was trying to win this fight. And and several different game plans were employed. It's just that Emmanuel Navarrete is a very difficult guy to deal with. And I told you guys, upon his ascent to the featherweight division, that this would be a very good weight for him because he was massive at super bantamweight. And those kind of dimensions at featherweight, they're going to make for an even more dangerous fighter because he won't be depleted from cutting down to 122. He'll fully round out at 126 and fight to his potential. That's what we saw yesterday. He had a very tough man in front of him and Diaz didn't have an ounce of quit in him. Though I reiterate, that point deficit alone would have discouraged a lot of other guys from trying as hard as Diaz did. Credit to him. Several knockdowns. And the point deduction and the volume punching and awkwardness of Emmanuel Navarrete. I mean, it really was a tough fight for Diaz. So there's two game plans employed in there from Diaz. You know, he started off wanting to box, stay on the outside, work off the counter, set up something big. And, and when that didn't work, he opted to crowd Emmanuel Navarrete. I want to say that he actually had more success crowding Navarrete than anything else. It's just that when you're going to crowd a guy, you're also going to come under the line of fire. You're going to have to sustain heavy shots, heavy leather trying to get inside on a guy like Emmanuel Navarrete who's not afraid of letting his hands go. Well, I reiterate, Diaz had more success with that than anything else. It's just that Emmanuel's a hard guy to deal with. It's not that Diaz is a bad fighter, it's that Emmanuel is a very good fighter. Perhaps not your textbook boxer, does have a very unusual, unorthodox style, but it works. It works for him, and that's what it's all about. Oh. Don't waste your time trying to be somebody else. Be you and do what works. You often hear it said that you shouldn't lunge forward. Don't lean over your lead foot, but that's 
exactly what Emmanuel Navarrete did when he leaned forward, fainted with the right, and fired off a big left uppercut, a peach of an uppercut that landed square on Diaz's face, split the guard, drops the guy. It's a wonder he got up from that. Tough as nails that guy is. You might think to yourself that Diaz gave other fighters the blueprint on how to get to Emmanuel Navarrete by going to his body, as he was having success in doing so, but look at what he had to endure in order to exact that plan. And look at how it all ended up working out, that yeah, you know, he's having success going to the guy's body, but this fight really ain't going his way. Emmanuel Navarrete, I'd say, is a force to be reckoned with at featherweight, and I view him as the apex predator of this division more than anyone else, more than any other active reigning world champion, including Gary Russell Jr., the very sparsely active Gary Russell Jr., who was ordered to fight, ordered to defend his WBC title against Ray Vargas towards the beginning of this year, yet here today has no fight date. Gary might be the longest reigning champion in this division. And he is a very talented fighter whenever he does fight, but that's the problem. He's not active enough for somebody like Emmanuel Navarrete. I don't think he has the size to deal with him or the punching power to keep him off. I actually give Emmanuel Navarrete very good odds to beat Gary Russell Jr. and most any other champion at this weight, including Leo Santa Cruz, who still hasn't rebounded off that loss to Javante Davis at 130 pounds. Does Leo come back down to 126? It's possible. He's still got a title there. The IBF title that used to be in the possession of Josh Warrington. That's still vacant. Kid Galahad's supposed to be fighting for it very soon, but I don't give Kid Galahad any kind of odds to beat somebody like Emmanuel Navarrete, provided Kid Galahad becomes the IBF champion. If I'm being honest, I don't think El Vaquero is going to have much luck getting any of these guys in the ring. They're going to say what they're going to say. They're going to talk their shit, but what they won't do is fight this guy. They won't do that. I want two of them are PBC fighters. You can fucking forget it. I hate to say this, but I think Emmanuel is going to have a hell of a hard time finding someone to unify with.